salvation, and happiness. It's your season. It's your time. God has plans for your life to prosper you and to give you hope and a future. Join us and learn how God's love and power can bring hope and happiness to your life. This is your opportunity for motivation, encouragement, and purpose. Welcome, church family. It's Megan Reed with another great segment of the Daily Gospel Network, where we bring you the Word of God and soul-stirring encouragement from churches, pastors, and choirs from all over the country. And today is no different. Check out this inspiring sermon from one of the church community's most dynamic pastors. Hey, what's up? Welcome to the 50th episode of Walk in the Word with Benevolent Faith Ministries. And as always, this is the show where we provide biblical interpretation that engages the words of the text, the context behind the text, and the application for us beyond the text. 50 episodes. Thank y'all for tuning in for 50 weeks to sit here and give, watch me be nice with the blah, blah. <laughs> watch me sit here and talk about the Lord. I'm so grateful and thankful for all of y'all. And so for this 50th episode, we've got a somewhat special show with a special topic because today I want to speak from the subject, more money, more problems. Hmm. More money, more problems. And yes, I can already hear some of y'all out there talking about, oh no, is he about to be talking about money and giving for this whole episode? Uh, well, yep, sure I am. <laughs> you know why? Because if you're going to call yourself being a follower of Christ, then yeah, giving is a major part of doing that. And it's not just about the money. It's also important to give of your time. That's equally important. But you know what? That's a whole nother show that we can do about tithing your time. Because yes, the kingdom needs your dollars, but it needs your time equally. Going to serve somewhere, uh, going to help somebody, that's just as valuable in the kingdom of God as giving money. But like I said, that's for a whole different show. Today, we want to talk about giving. Uh, particularly want to talk about money. Now, what I'm not going to do is sit here and ask y'all to give me money. Like at the end of this, you're not going to see me make an appeal. Please give money to Benevolent Faith Ministries. You know why? Because if you know the Benevolent Faith Ministries model, then you already know that we don't take tithes and offerings from our membership. As we like to say at our church, we don't want your money. We don't need your money, quite frankly. And it's not from an arrogant standpoint. What we're saying is we would much rather that instead of you giving that to us, give it to God's causes. And so we have what is known instead as giving partnerships. And you can learn more about what those are by just going to our website at uh, benevolentfaithministries.org and clicking on the link that says giving partners. And you'll learn all about them. But essentially, um, instead of taking your money, our church encourages you to give your money directly to the organizations and causes that we're partnered with that are already doing the work of the Lord all over the globe. Prison Fellowship, Open Doors USA, Compassion International, and many others. And for, again, for the full list of our giving partners, go to our website and click on the Giving Partners tab, benevolentfaithministries.org. So that's our model. OK, and we we don't need money. We don't want your money. But that don't mean that we're not going to stress, stress the importance of giving. Because, of course, other churches don't have our model and they need your money. OK, and let's keep it real. You're not giving your money to the church. You're not giving your money to the pastor. You're giving your money to the Lord's causes. Therefore. If your church is taking up tithes and offerings, but they're not spending, taking that money and using it to impact the kingdom of God, using it to impact the community, to change the world, then you need to examine that church more closely. If instead people is putting money in their pockets, I'm just saying, 
Examine your church. Know where your church's money is going. Any church that doesn't want to open up the books to its membership, that's a red flag. I'm just saying. And to be honest, y'all, I don't even think the real issue that people have with giving is the actual giving per se. I don't even think that's it. It's with the level of distrust that's associated with giving. That's what people struggle with. And in a way, they're justified because, again, there are a lot of preachers and pastors and churches out there. They're more about the dollar dollar bill than they are about the divine. They care more about making money than making disciples for Christ. Again, that some churches, not all, not painting all churches with a broad, with a broad stroke. I'm not doing that. Okay, it's not every church. So people shouldn't be bad mouthing the church experience overall just because there's a few bad churches. One bad apple don't spoil the bunch, right? Ain't that what we hear? Or because you had a bad experience with a faulty church before, don't go around talking bad about the church because the last church you went to ended up being a bad church. That was that church. That's not church overall. People give church a bad name for the wrong reasons. And listen, we did a whole show about this topic on our podcast, Deeper in the Word, which is available at digital podcast platforms everywhere, including Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, all that good stuff, and iHeartRadio. So we encourage you to go check out our show. And we did an episode entitled For the Love of Money or The Tithe is High. The Tithe is High. But we did that show like the fourth episode we ever did. We're up to like episode 60 something now. So we did this in 2020, and we gave an in-depth biblical analysis during that show about what tithing and offering and giving is, where it came from, and if it's still applicable to us today. I encourage y'all to go back and listen to that episode, because it gives you far more background, biblical information, historical information about tithing, about giving the 10%, because that's what the word tithe means, 10%. It means giving 10% of your of your first fruits of the money that you make, giving it to God. So when you get paid, instead of going to everything else first, you give 10% to God first. That's the first fruits. That's a biblical concept. We talk about all that in an episode and we explained it. Okay. I encourage you to go back and listen to that. But being truthful, y'all, aside from the distrust reason that I outlined previously, when it comes to tithing in the church, many people don't do it because they have questions about tithing that they want answered first before they commit to it. And that makes sense, right? You don't want to get involved in something that you don't know nothing about. And so that's what we're going to do today, y'all. On this special 50th episode, we're going to endeavor to examine the top questions that people have about giving or tithing to a church. And these are questions that typically prevent them or give them pause for giving or for contributing financially in any way, because they want these questions answered first. And like I said, ain't nothing wrong with that. Somebody's like, all right, I want to do this thing, but I need to know why I'm doing it and what's the purpose. Don't just tell people, God said, give, give, give. Give them the background and the history and why they should do it. And that's what we do on that show. And that's kind of what we're going to be doing today by answering these questions that people have, that people want answered before they start tithing. So join us during our 50th episode, as we examine the top questions that people have about paying tithes or giving to the church. Questions that tend to preclude them from giving. And so the first question is, if God owns everything, then why does he want mankind to give anything to him at all? If he owns everything, why we gotta give anything to him? Here's the proper response to that. Because what we're going to be giving y'all are answers to questions that people might give you. Why, why do you give to your church, whatever? Here's the proper response to that. Give. God doesn't need anything from us. But we need to give to him anyway. Why? Because in his instructions to us about giving in his word, God is helping us to understand the law of reciprocity. Everybody say reciprocity. You know what reciprocity is? It's the practice of exchanging things for mutual benefit 
or mutual dependence or mutual action or mutual justice. It's you do this for me, I'll turn around and do that for you. That's reciprocity, give and take, back and forth, ding and yang, because that's how God operates all throughout the Old Testament. He gives people these if then proposition, propositions. If y'all do this, then I will do this. But if y'all do that instead, then I, I will do that, this instead. See what I'm saying? He gives the if then propositions. And he applies this principle equally when it comes to giving. Meaning, God is saying that as we give y'all, we will receive abundantly according to the measure in which we give. What does that mean? That means that if you're stingy and you give a little, then God will give you back a little in your life. Why should he give you anything? You're not giving his causes. If you're generous with your giving, then God will bless you abundantly for that gift. And I've seen that happen. Okay, you may you might not want to believe it. You're like, yeah, whatever. Listen, talk to people with the testimony that that's happened to. Okay, or they gave something and miraculously they got money. Man, one time I gave to some cause that God had me do that I didn't have to do. Came out of my pocket for it, right? And I wasn't even really tripping off of it. Why I get a check like the next week from my dentist? A dentist I had been to in two years talked about. Oh, you overpaid us. Here's $300. The exact amount that I paid out. That's how God operates. I ain't got no reason to make that story up. And I'm not the only person with a story like that. So you give generously, it'll be given generously back to you. Not only do we get the harvest of the fruit, we also get more seed than we planted, which we can then use to create another harvest. You're blessed to be a blessing. It ain't for you to be. Yeah, look at me. No, it's for you to help others. Just look at what the word of God says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 to 10, about what happens when you give generously to God. Honor the Lord with honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. See that? God promises us that when we honor him with the first offering of our blessing. In other words, like I said, when you give to his causes first, out of your paycheck, before you pay your phone bill, before you pay your light bill, before you pay your car note, when you give him that 10% off the top, that first fruit, when you do that, he'll make sure that you have more than enough to pay your phone bill and your light bill and your car note. You see? That's what the barns filled with grains and the vats filled with wine. That's what that means. You have to look at text in its proper context. Back then, that was very important. Having grain stored, having wine stored. That was very important. So that promise is still applicable to us. It's about what's important to you, what you value, what God knows you need. He knows they needed grain and wine. What he knows you need, he'll provide for you if you keep him first. You got to trust him, though. So we honor God with our first fruits and we do it because we should be as good to him as he is to us. That's the slogan of benevolent faith ministries. A benevolent God deserves a benevolent faith. He's good to us. We need to be good to him and each other. So here's the next big question. Since the modern church is not under the Jewish law that requires you to tithe the 10%, then why should I even be obedient to that law? I'm not Jewish. I didn't exist during the Old Testament time. So I shouldn't have to give 10% of my money to the church. Why am I under that law? Here's the proper response to that. Tithing is not about obedience to the law, okay? It's about faithfulness to the God of promise. See, everything you read in the Old Testament about the requirements for tithing related to the law. That is, tithing was governed by the Jewish rules and regulations that were established during the days of Moses. That's the law. That's part of the law that the Jews, that the Israelites followed in their daily, uh, their daily lives. In fact, the Bible actually demonstrates, y'all, that tithing predated the law. Tithing came before the law. 
Genesis chapter 14, verse 20, tells us that Abraham offered tithe to King Melchizedek. Look at Genesis 14, 20, New Living Translation Version. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. That's tithing. And Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 to 22, tells us how Jacob made a vow to give God a tenth of everything that he gave Jacob. If God would protect Jacob on his journey and provide him with food and clothing, he was like, look, I'm building this altar right here. Lord, you protect me and everything, I promise you. I'm going to tithe 10% and always worship at this altar, okay? And here's the thing. Both of those occurrences, the one with Jacob and Abram, before he got named Abraham, Abram making a tenth of his offering to King Melchizedek, who was actually Jesus, but that's a whole other show, okay? We'll talk about that later. But both of those instances were hundreds of years before the laws were written and by the God and given to Moses. And the other, you know, the other laws were given to Moses or written by Moses. Hundreds of years before that. So giving to God, dedicating your 10% to him, it predates the law. It's not the law that mandated it. It was a thing about honoring God. It wasn't about obedience to the law. It was always about faithfulness to the God of promise, period. But for modern day believers, for us, the law was fulfilled when Jesus came and died on the cross and then ascend, uh, uh, resurrected and ascended back to heaven. The law was fulfilled at that point. Just look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Don't take it from me. Listen to the man himself. Matthew 5, 17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Look at how the English Standard Version, the ESV version, words that. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You see that? Jesus said he is the fulfillment of all the old laws under the uh, Judean, uh, um, Jewish, Israeli, Israelite law. God knew that mankind could never keep all those hundreds and hundreds, possibly thousands of laws that governed everyday life. That's why they had all those different sacrifices. The sacrifice of uh, protection, the sacrifice of, uh, you know, for, of, of forgiveness. They had all these different types of sacrifices. Why? Because people couldn't keep the law because people are imperfect. And God knew that. So he sent Christ to die for us because he was like, these people are going to keep struggling with this thing until I do something. So Jesus fulfilled the law so that we wouldn't have to be destroyed for our inability to follow the law. Makes sense, right? That's why Jesus is so important. So when the church began to grow, among other things, that's why it's so important. But when the church began to grow beyond just the Jewish people and it began to reach out to and convert the Gentiles, Church leaders struggled with this idea of whether or not these new believers should be commanded to follow the Mosaic law, okay? The whole purpose, in fact, the whole purpose of the Jerusalem Council was to decide how and if Gentiles should be included as part of the church because some of the old school Jewish, um, Jewish leaders were like, they need to get circumcised. They need to learn um, and practice and follow Judaism. They need to convert to our, to our religion. And James and Peter them was like, no, nah, that's not what God said. So that's not what we're going to do. And that's what the church ended up doing. To keep the peace among everybody, the church leaders didn't include information, instructions about tithing that the church must follow. They include other stuff. And you can see the list of what they did include amongst the instructions of what Gentiles had to follow by reading the text of Acts chapter 15. Verses 19 and 21. Acts chapter 15 just tells you that whole thing about the, uh, the Jerusalem Council. We'll read about that. So then if it's not the law, then what guides Gentiles, us, the modern church, in our giving to the causes of Christ? What is it if we're not under the law? Well, in addition to Jesus' directives about why we should give, which again is a whole other show. I didn't name like three different shows that we could do, but that's a whole other show. The New Testament. It also gives the following principles, y'all, for why people should voluntarily 
give to the church. Number one, to support the needs of others. Read about that in Acts chapter 2, verse 45, and Romans chapter 15, verses 25 to 27. We do it for that reason. We also do it to support Christian workers. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, and 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. And we give to expand Christian outreach. Read Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Friends, what you should take note of is this. In each of those passages I just referenced, it, uh, just referenced Acts chapter 2, verse 45, Romans 15, 25 to 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 11, and 12, 11 through 12, 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, Philippians 4, 15 and 16. And all those passages, we strongly suggest, first of all, that you go back and read those. But in all of those passages, no specific amount of giving is ever commanded and no percentage is ever suggested. And so while a tenth of your finances might be a good standard to use for the believer, it's clear that the early church didn't focus on a specific amount. Instead, they were just all about people having their needs met. I mean, we just said, Acts chapter 2, verse 45, that talks about how people were given support to the needs of others. Acts 2, verses 44 and 45 specifically tells that the people would sell what they owned in order to share that money with other people who didn't have money so that everybody would have food on their table and everybody could survive. That's how the church would get down when it first was founded. So the bottom line in the answer to your original second question is this. For us living under grace in Christ and not the law, there's no set amount that we're supposed to give. Instead, notice how the apostle Paul tells us to give. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, he says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's pretty clear. Give what you can. Don't be stingy. Give what you can and give cheerfully. Don't give begrudgingly. That's how we're supposed to give. It's not necessarily the tenth. That's a good standard to use, but we don't necessarily have to do that. But we do have to give. And we have to give willingly. Otherwise, God don't want it, straight up. Let's move on to the next question before we run out of time. Before we run out of time, excuse me. And that next question is, what happens if I fail to talk? What if I don't talk? And here's the proper response to that. A person's failure to be obedient to God when it comes to giving, that's only an indication that there's disobedience in all the other areas of that person's life. Look at how the Apostle James puts it in James chapter 2, verse 10. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. So basically, it's not about giving. It's about not being obedient to God. And the writer of Hebrews tells us plainly and succinctly why we don't want to fail to time. Hebrews 13, 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. In other words, tithing is pleasing to God. So not tithing isn't pleasing to God. See that? <laughs> you really want to go through this life displeasing God? God is not somebody you want to have as an enemy. You don't want God as an op, okay? Let's do one more question. And this one is typically the one that people usually lean on when it comes to giving. And that's, how do I tithe when I can hardly pay my bills right now? <laughs> and here's the proper response to that. Whenever you think that as a believer, whenever a believer thinks that way, their perspective is all wrong. And that is a demonstration of a mistrust of God. Sorry. That's the only way to put it, because most people are like, but God knows I'm broke, though. Yeah, he do. But that's the thing. One of the main issues that believers have with tithing is that they feel like they simply can't afford to do it. I mean, have you tried to go get gas lately? <laughs> have you tried going to the grocery store lately? Everything costs more right now. Inflation is running rampant in the world right now. 
And so those things are enough to make anybody doubtful about coming up off their money. There's no question that our current financial climate is in bad shape. And even people in the church are being seriously impacted by it. However, if you call yourself walking with Christ in this life, then you should know that God will provide a way out of your financial despair and will help you overcome if you will only trust him and follow his principles. Remember what I said earlier about reciprocity? He wanted us to learn about that and the if-then principles, the if-then propositions. What did I just say? God will provide a way for you to get out of financial despair if you will only trust him and follow him. That's an if-then proposition. If you will trust me and follow me, then I will make a way for you to get out of despair. However, if you don't trust me and you try to do it in your own power, then you ain't going to have much success. If then, if then propositions. Those are the cornerstone tenets of our faith, y'all. The book of Deuteronomy reminds us, quote, in Deuteronomy 8, 18, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Also, we're told in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that if we, quote, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. No, that's another if-then proposition. Jesus is saying, if you seek God first and try to live righteous first, then he will give you everything you need. That's a promise from Jesus himself, the if-then proposition brought from the Old Testament to the New through Christ. It's important that we recognize, y'all, there are no qualifiers placed on, uh, placed on those two passages of Scripture I just read, Matthew 6, 33, Deuteronomy 8, 18. There are no qualifiers with those. We have to acknowledge and accept that God's principles work no matter what the economy looks like, no matter how much gas costs, and regardless of any other outside circumstances, war, any of that, it doesn't matter. God's principles still work. And not that God gives us power to be wealthy only when the economy warrants it. No, God can bless you over and over again when the rest of the world is looking crazy. Now, I do realize that's easier said than done. And it's easier to say that when you're not going through stuff. Because whenever money is tight and our bills exceed our, uh, our, our incomes, the first thing to go is usually tithing. Because people think, they rationalize that by thinking, look, God knows how broke I am, okay? <laughs> so if I cut back on giving him his 10%, I'll have more money to pay my bills. Like, he understands that, doesn't he? But see, here's the problem with that line of thinking, my friends. God and his principles don't follow regular human logic. How God works is beyond us. And his way, his logic, that's beyond our comprehension. Y'all you know where I'm going. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You can't think like God. You can't get on his level. Get on his level. You can't do it. Church family, I pray that you were uplifted by those words. If you would like to find out more about today's pastor and listen to his full sermon, simply click the link. Remember to follow us on social media to keep up with more great sermons and messages we broadcast throughout the day, week, and month. I'm Megan Reed with the Daily Gospel Network. And until next time, remember, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me.